Uh, so I'm here today to talk about um, cuts. And what I'm really here today to talk about is data visioning. And I think um, I'll, do, I'll do a little bit of introductions first. So my name is Robert. Uh, I come from a company on the other side of the planet called Coordinates. Um, we make it easy for professional uh, map wranglers, which is probably where you guys all are, to find and access geospatial data and get on with their jobs. Be that making decisions or building maps or creating models or developing applications. And we help organizations publish data um, and share data either internally or with their partners or with the public. And so that, that works across uh, commercial, science, government, all that sort of stuff. Um, we run some public data portals for some countries and cities and yeah. And one of the things that I guess our customers and our users have, have constantly talked about is while there's lots of data out there and people need it for projects, it's how do we kind of get that and keep on top of it and keep on top of the updates and all that sort of stuff. And so uh, even if a country or, or a city has lots of open data, somebody will start a, a development project, they will go and find the relevant things they need, be that where fiber lines are or a property or uh, water, and then they'll do their project. And by the time the project finishes, maybe it's three, four years later, and that data is really out of date. And it doesn't make any difference whether the city has updated it every single day. People will grab it and use it in their projects and then kind of not update it. And so what I wanted to contrast this with is how software development worked. And we heard yesterday from Anita and uh, Kurt about how some of the technology and QGIS, the project works, how we manage stuff. And so like a software developer has a pretty good life. Besides having to make computers do what they want, which we all struggle with, they can work across multiple contexts. They can switch between tasks quite easily. They can start uh, branches of work and leave them and come back later and pick up where they left off. In terms of technically, they can do that quite easily. They can have features like pull requests where a change can be reviewed by their peers or their partners. Uh, and they can do code reviews and automation. And you, you talked about yesterday about how many tests that QGIS runs and how we make sure it works everywhere. And so we should be able to apply the same sort of things for, for data as well. And some of the stuff that uh, software developers just take for granted that they can always see is who changed what and when and maybe even why if commit messages are good. Whereas in the data world, we, we can't do that, right? You just find some data on a, a network share or in a database um, or in a zip file somewhere, and you can't really tell whether that was the original or whether somebody had taken the original and made one tiny little fix or what else happened. And so all these things up here are things developers use kind of every single day but they aren't practically available to the people managing data, which is kind of you guys. And this is what, uh, from our customers and our users, we, we find that need. There's some opportunities for, for being able to track versions of data. Um, there's a lot of talk about like data integrity, particularly in the context of science. So being able to take a scientific um, project or a scientific paper and reproduce the results which means you need to keep track of what, what code they ran, what data they had to make sure that, that it's right. And we have some of this in terms of things like uh, Git for code and Docker for environments, but we don't quite have the same thing for data. It's really hard as well for data to go the other way. So if you get data from a supplier or from a city um, and you find a mistake in it, people fix it for themselves, but they they don't contribute it back. And we have a lot of clients in the public sector who would really like to get some of those changes and improvements back again. Of course, the chainsaw starts. That's your data. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, and the other thing we, we all struggle with, I think, probably in this room, is working with people who aren't working in the QGIS world, right? So we all work in QGIS or PostGIS. That's great. But uh, we work with people who are working in the ISRI world or with CAD users, um, maybe like web developers or science people. And they're working in slightly different file formats. They're working in slightly different ecosystems. And interoperability is a bit of a pain. We can try and close some windows. Don't know if we could do much about those ones, but uh, hey, now you're going to die of heat death instead. And so I think um, we all struggle with this, like working with data across different ecosystems. Um, and our versioning tool could take in, could do some of this for us, right? Like we we can convert from one format to the other, but it's just a bit messy. And if we could figure out reasonable best practice things, it will work most of the time, and it will be pretty good. And the other thing is, um, I guess, synchronizing data across networks and making sure that what you see is what I've seen. And uh, version tools um, are pretty good at that. They make sure that, that bit for bit identical or feature for feature, we have exactly the same data. And so it should be able to help with that sort of stuff as well. Um, no more like page WFS requests, like falling out of sync and databases getting confused about who changed what. And so uh, we built this tool called Cart. Um, it's built on top of Git, um, which is you know like the leading uh, versioning system for software. And we made it batteries included, so that you don't necessarily need um, other tools. Everything is packaged there. It works on um, Windows and Mac OS and Linux. It doesn't interfere with any other software in your system. Things like CRS handling and stuff just kind of work out of the box. Database connections work. Um, it's not a big data solution for people with like 10 terabyte size tables. If you have that sort of data, you generally have developers and you can solve your problems. This is for kind of practical day-to-day -day work, the same sort of stuff you'd, you'd use in QGIS. And it's uh, open source. Um, and we want it to kind of be ecosystem agnostic. So it should work nicely for QGIS, but it should also work nicely for AutoCAD users or Arctis users. And uh, at coordinates, we've been kind of mirroring tens of thousands of data sets into CART. So it's pretty, pretty battle tested already. Um, yeah. And so I'm going to show you a little bit of a demo of how to get started with CART. Uh, okay, great. So um, I'm going to work in the QGIS plugin today, uh, which you can get from, from your friendly plugin store. Uh, there's a cat plugin here. And uh, what we're going to do is create a new repository, uh, which is pretty pretty easy. And... And then uh, we're going to get started by importing some data sets into the repository. And so CART supports importing from um, your regular kind of file sources. Uh, so I've got some shape files here. I'm going to import um, an island. And we can add that to the map. And then I'm going to import a couple other data sets as well. Got some roads and some buildings. There's a feature request list on the boards down by the thing. And I think my number one feature request for QGIS would be to like select a more healthy color palette when you like import a layer. It always seems to choose the most hideous colors by default. <laughs> You can choose whatever you like, but the, the ones it chooses by itself are not particularly pleasant. Uh, anyway, we'll live with it. Um, so uh, this is uh, the Chatham Islands, which are uh, way off the coast of New Zealand on the other side of the dateline, which makes life interesting for, for mappers on that, that side of the planet. Since everything appears on the other way, you have to scroll an awful long way. Uh, so we've got um, some buildings, we've got some islands, and we've got some roads. And we can... Um, 
look at so cats when you imported it created a commit for each one of these and so you can see i've, I've got like three commits in my my history already um so what i'm going to do is just edit a layer so the way uh cat kind of works is um locally it generates a geo package for whatever you're looking at and editing so it uses all the QGIS tools and it basically edits the geo package and then we save the changes in the geo package to the repository as a as a commit so i can go and edit my uh, buildings and i can add a new building here and i can call it QGIS house cool and then i can see what changes uh, i've made in my repository whoops save So I've added a new building, and I can see the uh, old and new values of attributes, and I can see uh, the geometry changes. And so we can um, uh, commit those changes, and I can go edit. And so my, my history of my repository has my commit, it has who did it and when, it has this unique ID which identifies all the data, not just, not just my change, but all of it. Um, and I can roll back and forward through time by doing that. Uh, so what we're gonna, um, the other thing that, that's pretty cool is um, working in branches. And so I talked about software developers switching uh, kind of context. So you start a project and then you get dragged onto some other task and you go to something else or you do a proposal and come back two months later and need to pick it up again. And so um, what we're gonna do is make a, make a branch and we're gonna call it a new development. Um, and in uh, this one, so I'm really gonna change this color. There we go, that's better. Uh, we're going to uh, add new rows. Um, and then here, it's gonna be a very windy road, like the best roads. And give it a name, big year road. Okay, and uh, the changes are saved. We're gonna commit that. Uh, And so this is this is the changes on our branch, and then we're going to edit the buildings, and we're going to add some new buildings down at the end of our kind of developments. Uh, we can do that. Lots of houses in the middle of nowhere. And then we're going to save those changes. We're going to commit them. And so. We can see in our, our uh, log of changes again that uh, up here, what's the point with this? That one here, we've got our new development branch, and you can see where, where it came from on our kind of main branch. And so we've got two new commits since then. And we can keep making changes to this branch over time. And they're all kind of saved independently, right? So we can um, like select a feature, decide that we don't want that house anymore. Um, delete that one. Save. Remove the house in the swamp. Okay. And then we can switch back to um, to our main branch at any time. And it's all gone. Uh, but then I can switch back again. It's fine. So we can switch back and forth between branches and everything kind of keeps track of the history. It's all good. Um, when we've finished our project uh, later on, uh, so time passes and things get approved or built or whatever it is, then we can uh, merge our changes uh, into our main branch. So, so, and if we look now in the the history, you can see that the main branch now points to uh, our, our kind of merge, and then we can see the history that was on there, and then we can um, see our other history. And so, so kind of life trip uh, goes on. Let me go back to da. Ah. There it is, okay. 
So as I said, uh, working copies are where you kind of work with and edit your data. And so different users of the same repository can use different working copies. So you can have a geo package, you can have a Postgres database. So you, uh, one pattern we've seen is people like doing edits in their QGIS environment and then having a like a production release, maybe that's shared internally or part of a web application. And so they can check out a specific change into their Postgres database which is kind of like releasing it to everyone else, but they keep doing the edits and all the other changes in uh, QGIS. Um, we also spot rasters and grids and point clouds, and that builds off um, cloud-optimized geotiffs and, and cloud-optimized point clouds, um, which helps you kind of uh, manage that sort of stuff too. Uh, one of the cool features is uh, we have spatially filtered clones, which I wanted to demo, but we've got a little bit run out a little bit out of time. And so... Say you have a data set of like roads of the entire of Slovakia, but you're only working in this neighborhood. And so it's kind of impractical to just keep loading up the entire country's roads every time you open your project. Everyone's nodding and like, yeah, we've done this before. And so um, typically what people do is like get the big data set and prop out their little area. And now they're, they're separate and you can never get updates or anything else into that um, into that data set again. And so what we have the ability is for you to get a local, your local working copy is just a subset of the larger data set. But one of the things, oh, no, it's on the next slide, um, is it makes it faster um, for working in locally. It reduces how much you're transferring of the network. And if you're, if you're editing this data, you can also make changes and they will be reflected in the full data set. So you haven't split off from the full data set, you're just working with like a little subset of it. Um, so vector and table, it kind of follows a SQL model. Uh, we have support for coordinate systems. You can add um, columns and attributes and make changes to those. Uh, as I showed, you could import from, from all the usual suspects. Um, it helps you with conflict resolution as well. So if you make a change and I make a change, then we can kind of reconcile them and choose whose is right or whose is wrong or whatever we need to do. And one of the other uh, cool features we've um, found is re-importing from a snapshot. And so if somebody emails you a shapefile, you can uh, uh, load it into like a repository and then you can get the next shapefile they email you like a week later and you can load that in and you get the next one and load that in and you build up your history and it only shows the changes even though they're sending you the full data set every time. So you could go to a portal and, and get new data or you could work internally with your team who isn't using carts and you can just be the most organized person on the planet who can tell them exactly what changed and when because it will say only this one feature changed in this week's data. Um, Rasters and grids, uh, we kind of support um, S3 uh, object storage and we build automatic virtual rasters for your, for your raster and grid data sets. And so this can help large data sets that are already on the internet. Um, you can kind of work with them. And, and again, that spatially cloned bit of like pulling down just a subset of a really big data set works okay. Uh, point clouds I kind of mentioned as well. It's the same sort of thing. So we can kind of have terabyte sized data sets um, in the background. You might not want that on your machine, but, but the whole data set can be that large. And that's the end of my talk. We have a, I have a workshop on this afternoon. So if you want to learn more and have a play with Kat, then it's um, after lunch in, in one of the rooms. So do come along. Sounds good, Robert. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. Thanks. Um, Michael Duchamp Mikhail from uh, Threlis. Um, you, you told us uh, Git was under the hood. Yeah. So these concepts are very, very easy if you practice a lot Git. Yeah. But for uh, new customers, how would they know about branches and pull and push? That was my first question. Yeah. And second is um, to. To use Git, you need to convert your data into text uh -huh. version of uh, of it. Yeah. Or um, how do you, yeah, do you, do you help Git to know what uh, what has changed? Do you so you explore all the features, or it's it's not 
like it's built on the building blocks of Git. And so one of the reasons we did that was because Microsoft and others are pouring like dozens of developers into Git all full time. And so they, they make it awesome for really massive repositories and we can build on that, that those building blocks. So it doesn't store your features as text. If you, um, you can push and pull to a Git remote, but if you pushed it to GitHub and when it looked at it, you wouldn't see anything sensible, um, but it works fine. Uh, and so, yeah, it kind of kind of builds on top of Git, but it doesn't doesn't kind of expose the the Git part too much. Um, and yeah, I think the explaining part's probably probably the hardest bit. But I think the you know developers spend a lot of time putting code in zip files as well, and then they figured out that there was a better way. Um, and I think we have a have a hard job of trying to explain it well, but it's worth it. Quick question. Uh, you, you mentioned when adding files to this uh, project, it will turn them into a geo package. Yeah. And then you can keep track of the changes. Yeah. What would happen if I would change the source code, uh, the source file, um, in a completely different project? Yeah. And, so... and, and lost, uh, uh, didn't remember that I used it in some other place. Yeah. So when you check out a cat repository, by default, it will generate a geo package. And you can use it in any tool, right? So you can load it into. Um, uh, QGIS, you can edit it via SQL, you can do whatever, and it will keep track of those changes, and Cart can see what's been changed since you uh, checked it out. So it's nothing QGIS specific, and all the QGIS plugin is doing is opening the geo package and adding those layers. So any edits you make to those files will be tracked by, by Cart, and then it can tell you whether you want to commit them or drop them or whatever else you want to do. More questions? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, is it possible to uh, think about two different roles, uh, like an administrator and a very, very uh, uh, beginner uh, to administrate it, or it's not that way how to use it? Um, so coordinates are starting to provide like hosting for cart repositories, which is the same as Git hosting, but... Um, and the idea over time is that we we implement things like pull requests so that um, I, as an editor, can make a change, but then maybe my peers review it and approve merges or changes. And we've seen from a lot of customers it's really hard to review how, how data edits happen. Um, and so that's where we kind of want to get to of, of being able to do that so that you can create a process that works for your team. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? I've got a question. Awesome. Um, Merging Maps uses uh, uh, GeoDiff. Uh -huh. it's a, it's, how does it relate to, to this? Is it similar? or? Yeah, so Merging Maps is really awesome. Um, Merging Maps is quite QGIS specific, and it takes your whole project and, and versions that, the data and, and the project and the other stuff. Um, and so I guess it's, it's, it's kind of versioning for QGIS, which is awesome. Um, I think what we want to do with CARD is make versioning for, for geospatial data. And so we're a little bit more data specific. Um, but at the same time, we, we uh, work across different, I guess, ecosystems a little bit. Or we try and we're going to and try and do a little bit more than Mergen's trying to do. So um, I guess they're complementary. It's not a, not a thing. Um, yeah. Thanks for explaining. Yeah. One more question. Thanks. And to, to go on on um, the field uh, work, the discussion, do you have any customers uh, who use QField or uh, Merging Maps and, uh, and you help them to, to use CART instead of their tools? To, uh, to I don't know if we've had people who have switched from Merging to CART. I know we have some, um, there's been some really interesting projects um, people have built with CART. Uh, one of them was like a... Um, they have to do like a development plan for their region every five or 10 years. And they have lots of proposals and ideas and they need to go out to consultation. And what they need to do is keep track of like, what did we send out to this group for consultation? What did we send out to these guys? What changes did we make afterwards? Um, so that um, they can have a really robust process of how they develop this plan. And so they've used CART to kind of track all those different branches and ideas and when things were, were like approved and changed. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Robert. That was a really nice presentation. Uh, the organizers have a little present for you. Cheers. And if you want to learn more, uh, go to his workshop and a big applause. Yeah, 130 this afternoon. <laughs>